Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an attendee in listen-only mode. Well, hello everybody that's logging in at the moment from all around the world. Uh, my name is Haytham Cubber and I'm an ENT surgeon from the Children's Hospital in Glasgow in Scotland. And I'll be hosting this paediatric tracheostomy decannulation webinar. Uh, I have colleagues from Melbourne and I have colleagues from Glasgow and we're going to do an international perspective on paediatric tracheostomy decannulation. So welcome to everybody. I'm going to start off by saying thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar. We're going to be about an hour. I want to say a big thank you to Medtronic and to Smith's Medical who've given us some unrestricted grants to allow us to host these uh, web-based sessions. And that's very generous of them. I just want to say at the start that none of us has any financial conflict or any other conflicts of interest to declare. This is very much an interactive session. We're going to have presentations uh, from Glasgow and from Melbourne. But if at any time you have questions, please type them in at the uh, point marked with the question mark on your control panel. And we will get to them during the question and answer session at the end of the, um, of the session. So just to say, paediatric decannulation. Um, nobody wants any child to have a tracheostomy tube longer than they actually need it. Tracheostomy obviously has a morbidity and a mortality. These things can be measured. Children die from tube occlusion, from accidental decannulation and a variety of things. So we want to get tubes out as soon as we possibly can. But it can be very difficult to know when a child is actually ready to have their tracheostomy tube removed. And it's not always obvious. So we need to have a process by which we have a trial and see if it is possible and safe to remove the tube. And safety is the key word. We need to do this in a safe way where the child is not in any danger. If you just take out the tube and see what happens, there is a chance that the stoma closes quite rapidly and you can't get the tube back in. And this can be fatal. And I was involved with a legal case from a different hospital where I wasn't working. But quite recently with a child where this was done, the surgeon pulled out the tube, the child did not manage, the tube wouldn't go in, and the child suffered a major hypoxic brain injury. So, you know, it is not normal practice just to pull out the tube and see what happens. We usually go through a process which is a little safer. Now, you may have seen the webinar in January of this year done by David Brown and Kelly Crafty from University of Michigan, which was an excellent webinar. And like all of them, including this one, it's archived on the GTC website so that you can go and watch it at your leisure. If you didn't see it, I recommend you go and watch it. It's a very good webinar, very good indeed. Just to very quickly summarize what they described, um, they talked about candidacy for decannulation, and one of the things was obviously for the child to be off at least daytime ventilator support for a minimum of three months, tolerating a passive your speaking valve, um, evidence on endoscopy that their original airway problem had resolved, whatever the reason for the tracheostomy was, that they were able to manage their own secretions with cough, that they had no evidence of sleep apnea, and that can be difficult to judge, so you may wish to consider adenotonsillectomy. And as is standard practice across North America, they would use a prolonged trial of home capping of the tube, followed by a relatively short hospital admission. Now, they would facilitate the capping trial at home by maybe putting in a slightly smaller tube, and they'd increase the length of time that the child spent with the tube capped until they were able to tolerate it for most waking hours for at least three or four weeks. So that's pretty standard in North America to have these prolonged capping trials at home. They'd get a polysomnogram with the tube capped, and then they'd admit for a very short hospital admission, just a couple of days, for an airway endoscopy under anaesthetic, short spell in the intensive care unit with the tube capped, followed by removal and a day of observation. And so that's a relatively short hospital stay. Now that's standard practice across many centers in North America. It's a perfectly safe and good way to do it. It's been well described and well researched. But it's not the way it's done everywhere. And there are other places in the world other than North America, and they do things differently. So the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss practice from two other parts of the English speaking world. So we work in Glasgow in Scotland, and we have colleagues on the line from Melbourne in Australia. And we're both gonna describe how we go about 
doing our tracheostomy decannulations in children and talk about what's similar and what's different from standard North American practice. So today's panel uh, from Melbourne, we have John Kemp and Sue Ellen Jones and they're respiratory nurse consultants that do the majority of the tracheostomy training and care. And Joe Harrison, who's a consultant respiratory paediatrician uh, with a major interest in tracheostomy management. And my colleagues here on the, on the couch in Glasgow, I have Sylvia Harrison, who's lurking out the camera, and Joyce Gray, who are our tracheostomy nurse specialists, and Tashkin Anandam, who's one of my colleagues uh, as a paediatric ENT surgeon. So I'm going to start off by handing over to Tash and Joyce to talk about um, our paediatric decannulation protocol here in Glasgow. So hi, I'm going to give you uh, an overview um, with the help of Joyce uh, about the Glasgow decannulation protocol uh, in the paediatric population. Um, so Glasgow, like much of the UK, and if you consider the main uh, children's teaching hospitals here, uh, the protocol is broadly uh, based on the one uh, by Great Ormond Street. Uh, and this is the, the title of the paper that was produced in 1997, uh, describing their regime. Uh, and ours uh, is very similar. Uh, I think it's important to mention the but perhaps the main differences between uh, the protocol in the UK uh, and that of North America. Uh, and probably the, the most important uh, factor here is that capping trials at home is just not the standard practice here in the UK. What we rely on is a hospital admission, a slightly prolonged hospital admission, uh, where uh, the children are actively observed. Um, uh, so you have nursing and medical staff observations uh, leading the, the decannulation uh, trial, uh, and we're not relying so much on uh, parental home uh, parental reporting. The principle is that it usually this is carried out over a period of five days, and it's done sequentially with initially downsizing of the tracheostomy tube, followed by a, a period of capping of the tracheostomy tube, and then followed by uh, the decannulation. Uh, this is then followed by a period of observation, and as I say, normally it takes about five days. So you could aim to have a child admitted on Monday uh, and uh, have them discharged, hopefully with a successful decannulation uh, the following weekend. I'm going to hand over to Joyce now, who's going to talk to you uh, about the protocol itself. Um, and then I'll tell you um, our sort of uh, evidence, if you like, as to why we stick to that protocol. Okay, so starting off with how we would um, make a decision about the trial of a decannulation for a patient. We run tracheostomy clinics once a month um, and we at these clinics review our patients every six months um, to be able to make that assessment of are they able to um, consider the trial of decannulation. We would review the airway pathology at these appointments with the ENT consultant respiratory consultant, um, the, one of our airway nurses, either myself or Sylvia, um, and our speech and language therapist. Um, we may carry out a flexible bronchoscope in clinic. We have facilities to be able to do that. If it was, say, for a vocal cord, possibly wanted to see if that approves or if they had um, tracheal bronchomalacia, that kind of thing, we can do that in clinic. But we would always actually um, plan for a micro laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy under general anaesthetic um, prior to the trial of decannulation in the hospital. Um, in clinic, we would also consider things like um, preparing the patient and the family for this by giving them an information leaflet about the process um, and consider whether they may need um, play specialist input for the child, giving them maybe a doll with a tube and a cap and things, as this can be quite a challenge of process, get the child used to this idea. So then um, we would go ahead and um, uh, organise for the planned um, microlaryngoscopy and bronchoscopy. Um, and we would maybe do that within the same, like at the start of the week and then start the decap process in the same admission. Sometimes we'll do that as a day admission and then maybe the following week or two weeks bring them in for a separate admission to start the trial of the decap. So that's just an overview as you can see at the moment. I'm going to go into each day in detail now. So the first day, well first of all we've got the um, micro laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy um, which is done in the six weeks 
um, at the most prior to the trial. We would review again the airway pathology at this and um, ensure that there was no um, requirement for further um, treatment of um, stenosis or granulations um, before we then try the trial. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. So, day one, yeah, perfect. Um, we would um, do an elective admission usually on a Monday or a Tuesday, following a successful um, microlaryngoscopy and bronchoscopy. Um, and they would be admitted under our um, ear, nose and throat um, consultant. Um, but the key person within the decannulation process of that week would be the airway nurses, as they will link between the consultant um, and the patient and the ward nurses, taking this forward throughout the week. We would assess in the ward that we've got enough staffing to be able to manage this patient. We generally will nurse them in a four bedded open bay um, with um, one nurse for the four patients. Um, when we're actually um, do, making a change to, uh, to that child's airway by um, downsizing or putting the cap on, the airway nurse will be present for the, usually the first one to two hours following that for clo even closer observation. Um, we will, for, on the first day, do the downsize, usually to a size three tube, um, and then we will do continuous pulse oximetry monitoring um, and signs of respiratory distress um, continuously for the next 24 hours. Um, we also will have a bed head card that's just um, that's, uh, specifically for decannulation and um, detailing as well in for this procedure. Um, and information about what tubes to be using if anything um, was um, to go on. Um, and we'd also have a documented care plan for the nurses to be able to refer to um, of who to contact um, and what steps to take um, if there was any deterioration um, while we weren't present. Okay, so if then that is a successful overnight, um, we will review them in the morning on our EIT ward round. Um, and um, if it's been successful, we'll discuss again with the patient and the family um, about the plan to then apply the cap that day. Um, it's making it clear that once we apply the cap, the child should no longer require suction. And if they, if they are requiring the cap to be removed so or suctioning, we would class this as being an unsuccessful trial. Um, the, again, once we apply the cap, um, back on to continuous pulse oximetry monitoring, um, for the 24 hours. We would also do it as a um, downloadable um, a pulse oximetry monitoring so that we can then assess that in the morning of a continuous link, how what it was like overnight while we slept. So on to the next day, um, day three, again reviewing the ward round and also we would then um, consult um, our labs about the oximetry results from overnight sleeping. Um, and following that, make a decision as to whether it, it's appropriate to remove the tube and safe to remove the tube at this point. Um, on removal of the tube, we will clean the stoma and we'll apply of dressing, which is usually gauze swabs and some sleek tape um, so that it's not really breathable and be able to clear discussions past the stoma. Um, again, back onto the um, continuous pulse oximetry monitoring. Um, and close observation of their um, respiratory Finally, we would move on to reviewing them again the next morning um, and if we have been successful having taken the tube out altogether um, and having the stoma closed over um, with its addressing, um, we would then plan a kind of phase discharge with the family this will usually incorporate use, carrying out basic life support training, just to update the family because there's changes in that from going from no long, from having a tracheostomy to no longer having a tracheostomy. Um, we would allow them to start to mobilise outside of the ward and around the hospital and then gain confidence actually going out of the hospital. Because what I think they've been very used to having stock and equipment to carry about and um, able to you know carry out suction. And when the child coughs, they've got to get used to the child coughing and coping with those secretions without requiring any suction. If they live further away from the hospital, um, we would um, recommend that they would go and stay at the parent accommodation um, with their parents for an overnight stay before then 
tra traveling home to wherever that may be. Obviously, we cover quite an area in Scotland and islands and everything. Um, we were then uh, following up on our tracheostomy clinic about three months after decannulation, and we would um, plan for stoma closure about six months if it hasn't closed. Okay. So just to recap, um, our admission is usually for about five to seven days um, for the trial of decannulation. And it can um, be um, a stops at any point um, if there's you know, signs that the child is not coping. Um, and then reassessed when we're suitable for that child again. Again, that'll be discussed, rediscussed in clinic. Okay, moving back over to Tash. Great, thanks Joyce. Um, so that's a summary of um, how we do our uh, Glasgow decannulation protocol. Um, I'd like to tell you um, sort of the evidence that we have for um, why we do it and why we've stuck to this. Um, and that's summarised quite nicely um, in a paper um, produced from um, the Glasgow Children's Hospital uh, ENT department. Uh, this is a paper um, uh, that was published in 2016 um, looking at our um, successes, successes and failures uh, related to paediatric tracheostomy decannulation. Um, the uh, conclusions um, or, um, or the, the summary, if you like, of uh, that paper, we looked at, at a three-year period from 2012 um, through to uh, 2015. Uh, there were 45 children that underwent tracheostomy decannulation uh, and in total there were 57 uh, trials of decannulation. So obviously there are some children who had more than uh, one attempt uh, at a decannulation um, uh, event. If we look at the age range of these patients, uh, the youngest was six months, um, but the oldest child uh, was 16 years uh, of age. But looking at the medians um, uh, for these uh, children, looking at the median age and weight, um, uh, which was um, two and a half years and uh, around 12 kilograms, it's important to note that actually a lot of the children are being decannulated um, in the earlier age group. The overall success rate of um, a decannulation um, uh, event was 58%, so approaching two out of three children were able to have their tracheostomy tube removed. Um, and I think that that's perfectly satisfactory. We don't have to aim for 100% decannulation. The most important factor is actually that each um, trial uh, is done successfully in terms of its safety. Uh, and that's important for us to note that actually with our protocol, we did not have any adverse events. So there were no um, issues with tube reinsertions or problematic insertions or um, um, uh, you know, any significant morbidity or mortality associated uh, with this. Um, this uh, next um, slide is hopefully uh, showing you a flow diagram which quite nicely illustrates um, the results uh, of the, the decannulation trials um, and particularly we can uh, look at the points at which children um, uh, did not progress further. If we consider the very first day, so the children have been assessed in the tracheostomy clinic and deemed suitable to attempt a trial of decannulation. Um, following their airway endoscopy, so their formal airway assessment uh, with a general anaesthetic, a quarter of the children were actually at that point um, thought not to be suitable to continue along the decannulation protocol. So already at day zero, if you like, um, we're down to 75%. Uh, at day one, when we are downsizing the tracheostomy tube, um, uh, there uh, are 16 percent of children actually don't manage to go any further so they're already struggling at this stage. Day two when we look at capping of the tracheostomy tube this is actually um, in, in terms of numbers 50 percent of patients um, the, in the pediatric population are coming into difficulties at this point. So half the children who did not go on to have a successful trial of decannulation are actually failing at this stage um, in the pathway. So this is all within the first couple of days. 
But actually, we do the pathway does go on for another couple of days after that. And even at day three and at day four, although it's perhaps only one child at each of those days, it's important to realise that there are children who, even at this later stage of the, of the process, are running into difficulty and have had to have their decannulation uh, attempts uh, aborted uh, with um, the tube uh, going back in. So overall, as conclusions from our paper, we can um, see that actually the five-day protocol um, uh, seems to work very well uh, for us. Um, each of those five days have shown uh, patients having difficulties um, at that stage. So there is a value to be had from each of those days of the protocol. Um, it's fair enough that not every child was able to be decannulated and that some children required more than one uh, event. Uh, but most importantly for us, again, we were able to offer every child a safe attempt at decannulation um, in, uh, uh, with a period of observation and active observation in a, a hospital environment. And again, it gives them the, the chance to formally establish the next stage, perhaps a, a, another attempt at decannulation um, or uh, further review in the tracheostomy clinic. Um, to decide on the next course of action. So for us, the, the most important fact here was um, that there didn't seem to be any value in shortening that period, but actually we have a, a safe way of uh, performing decannulation. Uh, we have no recorded adverse events in that uh, period. Um, so I'm actually now going to hand back to um, Haytham. Okay, so um, thank you very much for uh, Tash and Joyce. Um, I have to apologise in a minute. Apparently we're having some slight difficulties with the slides and they may not have all shown up at the start, but we can, uh, we can show any slides you want to see later on if we need to. But what I'm going to do now is just remind you that if you have any questions, please type them in using the question mark uh, icon on your control panel, and we will get to those in the Q&A session at the end. What I'm going to do now, though, is hand over to my good friends and colleagues over in Melbourne. So we have Joe Harrison, who's arrived there, sitting at the back, and we have Sue Ellen and John, and they're going to tell us about how things are done. Um, the Melbourne way. Thanks, Haytham, and everybody over there in Glasgow, and everyone who's participating in the GTC. Um, as Haytham said, we're here in Melbourne, and I just wanted to introduce uh, our hospital for a start. So our hospital is a beautiful facility. It's been open quite a few years now has 323 beds and quite a lot of admissions per year. So it's a busy hospital, but we have around 39 to 40 children, that number changes every year who present for um, tracheostomy care and management. I had to put this in. This was the uh, one advantage of getting up at five o'clock to come and present. I got to see this beautiful sunrise and the hot air balloons over coming on my way to work and uh, the hospital is just down off screen on the right and you can see a little bit of the city of Melbourne in the background there. So this was not a view I see most mornings, <laughs> but it was lovely to see it. So what do we do? So we know that, um, we know that children uh, with a tracheostomy have a high incidence of morbidity and mortality. And so we have a, a specialised service here, which we nicknamed the CATS, Kids and Tracheostomy Service, which is a multidisciplinary team and it offers a specialised tracheostomy service. So we have weekly multidisciplinary team meetings and they are for both inpatients primarily, but also outpatients. And we have a fortnightly specialist clinic review. Um, and we have, we're very lucky to have the complex care hub or home care support who are very integrated in both in uh, for home care patients. So just again, trying to get the slides to move. So just to recap, decannulation is the planned um, intervention for the permanent removal of a tracheostomy tube. Once the underlying condition or indication for the trach has been resolved or corrected, here at this hospital in 2018, we had approximately, well, we did have 11 patients who presented or were admitted for elective decannulation. And all of these children were discharged home tracky free. Um, just to give you a rough idea, that's sort of our average number. In 2017, we had nine patients. Um, the difference between elective 
decannulation trial and an accidental decannulation is that an accidental decannulation is a medical emergency and does require immediate um, action on the part of the caregivers. And we do try and, obviously everyone does, minimise the event of those occurring at home or in hospital. So part of the, as Glasgow, part of the de, uh, decannulation process is in the planning. And so here we have our patients are reviewed at both their CATS um, meeting, which are weekly, and at the multidisciplinary clinic um, visits. So that's where they are reviewed. And at these reviews, we uh, really assess whether they're ready for a trial of decannulation. The decannulation plan is really tailored to the needs of the particular patient. But as with Glasgow, it's usually a stage process and generally will start with the trial capping of a tracky tube at a clinic visit. If this is tolerated, then we will give the, the family, a, the caregivers a cap and they will continue with intermittent capping daytime only and only while their child is awake and they have to be able to directly um, supervise their child. And the reasons for this are that if the child's tolerance should change with the capping at any time, the caregiver can remove the um, cap and, and, and make sure that they're safe. We, after the, if the capping's tolerated, we will do an, uh, arrange for an airway assessment. And this is a rigid and flexible bronchoscopy. Um, and done primarily by the ENT and the respiratory teams. Um, with that evaluation, depending on what is um, discovered, they, the child will be uh, scheduled for an elective decannulation trial. And we try and do that within six weeks of the bronchoscopy. Depending on what the findings are at the bronchoscopy, it may or may not include a downsizing of the tracky tube at that point. And if we do downsize at that point, it's usually just one size, um, one size from the tube that's in situ. And that can allow the child some time to get used to a smaller tube in their airway and then also facilitate capping if that's being used. And then we will plan the admission. So I'd like to hand over to John. He's going to run through this whole process of what happens with um, with our admission planning and discharge planning. So over to you, John. Thanks, Mom. Hi, everyone. Um, the first day of admission usually occurs in the afternoon. Uh, child arrives and receives medical assessment admission to our medical unit, which has a specialist high dependency section of six beds where there's a one to two nurse patient ratio and all the nurses who work in there have received training and a tracheostomy competent. Um, if the tube has not already been downsized, downsizing will occur uh, in the evening and with capping and uh, assessment again of how well the child tolerates the capping. Uh, we'll do overnight downloadable oximetry and keep what we call a sleep diary, so observing for um, the usual vital sign parameters, uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, etc. But in particular, looking at um, abnormal respiratory sounds and increased respiratory effort on behalf of the child. And day one of decannulation or day two of admission, um, the child will have fasted for two hours prior to going ahead with decannulation, but prior to that, the team will come and review and assess the night that they've had, and hopefully they've had a nice, quiet, uneventful evening. Um, they'll review the downloadable oximetry and then plan for removal of the tube around uh, kind of early mid-morning, because uh, we will staff up for that day and nurse them one-to-one -one for that shift. Uh, we usually like the parents to, uh, or like we want the parents or caregivers to be present to help reduce or alleviate any anxiety on behalf of the child, because um, it's quite a significant event for them having the tube removed, because it is very much a, a part of them and uh, being a significant part of their life. Um, 
and and it is quite an event for the parents too. Sometimes they um, souvenir the tracheostomy tube. Um, once the tube's removed, or immediately prior to the tube being removed, there's another full set of uh, vitals and assessment done to the child. Tube comes out and we observe them for a few minutes just to see what their breathing's like uh, through the stoma and through their upper airway. And then we'll apply an occlusive dressing to the stoma. Um, I should, sorry, sorry, finish a bit more there. Um, <clears throat> once the tube's removed, uh, they'll be continuously monitored with pulse oximetry throughout the day. And initially we'll do frequent observations 15 minutely for the first hour or two, and then we'll gradually pull back on the frequency of observations if the child is well, and then they can resume, uh, again, all going well, they can resume light diet a couple of hours after the tube comes out. It's important to, to note that um, they will usually stay in their room for that day, um, but we're also very insistent that they do not leave the ward itself um, for 24 hours post the tube being removed. Uh, so day three of admission, which is day two of decannulation, they will have had uh, overnight oximetry again deformed. Um, and in the morning, hopefully, uh, we can get them active. And uh, if they're in that kind of toddler or preschool age group, um, get them running about the ward and see how they tolerate a bit of exertion without the tracheostomy tube. Um, mindful too, in terms of our observations of how well they manage their own secretions now that they have to expel them themselves, um, either cough, or swallow them through their upper airway. Um, managing the stoma is always fun. Um, invariably, every time they cough, uh, this dressing blows off. Um, so we spend a lot of time re applying, reapplying, and reinforcing dressings over the stoma. And they'll have a um, obviously a, a medical review by the covering team that day. And then day four of admission, uh, we're ready for looking at going home. So we've had approximately 48 hours tracheostomy free. Um, again, multidisciplinary team review in the morning um, and often again preceded by overnight oximetry that night. Um, we uh, reassess the stoma and uh, give the parents a healthy supply of dressings to be going home with. And um, again, all, all going well, uh, they should be ready to, for discharge home. And we might um, think about hanging on to them for a bit longer if there's some upper airway noises, stridor that's a bit persistent, or there's some concern in terms of, or caution I should say, in terms of some parents living in a more rural or remote area. Uh, post discharge, they'll be reviewed again in uh, the multidisc clinic uh, at about two weeks and four and three months. Um, usually assessing uh, again the upper airway function and closure of stoma which might be addressed at about the three month mark by the ENT team if the stoma persists. And they'll continue to be seen at the uh, uh, multi clinic. Would that be an additional slide? I don't know. Oh, no, repeat slide then. <laughs> um, it's always interesting when they uh, first go home because the parents are so used to having a trachea in situ and used to carrying um, lots of equipment with them. Um, frequently, they still want to take all their equipment home with them. Um, we do like them to persist uh, for a short period with use of the uh, pulse oximeter at home, which uh, parents here are normally issued with. Um, and often it's um, reassurance for them. Um, so they can sleep a bit easier at night, um, but it can possibly uh, alert them to some 
uh, airway issues if there's some secretion management problems with the child at home, in which case they would then soon represent here. Water. 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 Mm. So, oh, so just for if their stoma remains patent, we oh, yes. living in the Absolutely. land with a lot of water, we um, don't advise them, of course, to go swimming until their stoma is closed, and they still have to take precautions, bathing and showering, um, with while, if they have a persistent stoma. So just good to reinforce that with the families as well. Um. So uh, I think that's um, back to you, Haytham. Yeah. All right. Um, our contact details. <laughs> and if anyone wants to see the clinical practice guidelines uh, for tracheostomy care, so just um, again to reinforce that paediatric tracheostomy is not, there's not huge numbers and some of us who have smaller centres um, it's great if we can share our information and expertise and part of the GTC is a really good opportunity for us to be able to, to um, share our knowledge with others and, and what works. So it was um, really interesting to hear uh, the process in Glasgow and reassuring in one way that we seem to be doing the same things, which is great and trying to minimise harm for, for the children and their families by being cautious. Mm. And also you, you've inspired us, Joyce, because we've thought that um, doing a revisiting the CPR um, assessment with the parents prior to discharge post decannulation is a really good idea and we'll adopt that. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, back to you, Haytham. Great, well, um, thank you very much. So uh, let me just get rid of that. Um, so I just wanna uh, thank uh, the guys in Melbourne for a very nice presentation. And, and we also were struck by how similar um, the protocols are, and, and in many ways similar to the North American protocols in the sense that we're just trying to maximize safety, minimize harm. Uh, we do it in slightly different ways, but but the differences are quite small. Um, those of you watching, then please keep the questions coming. We've got some good questions on here, which I'm gonna go through one by one, uh, but do keep them coming. I'm gonna start off, we've had a question in from Cindy Riley, who's asking about families that are resistant to decannulation due to them getting some kind of secondary gain from the from having a child with a tracheostomy. Um, so perhaps, over in Melbourne, guys, do you, do you have much experience of families who are resistant to decannulation? No, no, no the opposite. <laughs> they're, no, they're very keen. <laughs> I think the only, um, there's not really, from my experience with families, there haven't really been any benefits that would out financial or physical benefits that would outweigh have not their child not having a tracheostomy. Mm. So most families are very keen to see the end of the trachea. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, we've had we've had problems. Yes, we have. People oh. come on being able to change the child's airway themselves um, and have suction, so it can be quite uh, quite apprehensive about returning these items and you know no longer having the control of their child's airway. That is very much a control issue. You know that they have to rely on the child to cough and to breathe, and they're not in control anymore. But also, there's financial benefits. You, you get. Um, Disability living, disability living allowance and other financial benefits here when your child has a tracheostomy and your benefits get stopped when the tracheostomy is removed. Mm -hmm. And also, some of these children will be provided with a care package, not all. Out, out with Glasgow. Glasgow we do it. In Glasgow home. we don't. But some of the children from other areas around Scotland will get some kind of nursing support package at home because their child has a tracheostomy, which they then lose, of course, when the tracheostomy is lost. So there are... It's also it's the extended support and the circumstances yes. and the, the knowledge that you know you have a child with a tracheostomy. Actually, the hospital may know your child with a tracheostomy. Um, it, you know, everyone becomes very aware. It's not attention-seeking behaviour, but you know they, they, they can get very used to the, the setup that they're in. It's comfortable for them in terms of it's safe. And we spend so much time t telling them as we're putting the tracheostomy and how this makes their airway safe. Um, you know, they get used to that. They've got a, gotten over all of the hurdles of getting used to that. And they're now in a situation where you're talking about taking this away from them. So it, it's quite a big emotional leap, but yes, and you know, certainly uh, in, uh, you know, 
our society here where, where you do have financial benefits and all the support that comes along that's a, another thing that yeah yeah we, we do have some patients who um uh, you know get a little caught up with, with that aspect i mean most are really keen most no are, most are most very are, very keen but, there are. but it's, it's occasional that we get the resistance so how do we deal with it then joyce um i think it's looking on the benefits of not having a tube and being able to do things like going swimming taking a child on holiday without having to take all this kit with you um, and focusing on the benefits of no longer having it um, and obviously these children are more at risk of you know picking up on chest infections and everything like that i think it's you know saying that's the family that it's getting back to normality and normal normal life for a child that doesn't have to carry all this um, and not have the attention when they go to school and nursery that somebody's always following them about with a suction bag running behind them on their bike you know so i think it's just trying to to um, focus on focus them. on that yeah, focus the, on the, the child and the benefits for them mm -hmm. um because you know especially as they get older and, and their social interactions become so much more important um well you know that, that's far more valuable you know they want to blend in and be part of you know those social pair groups and not stand out by having a tracheostomy so, so i think it, it is that it's trying to convey to the parents that the, the you know huge benefits to the child sometimes it's understanding of the child as well depending on their age you know um, and we've had you know involvement from maybe psychologists to explain to the child that why they no longer need this and um the benefits but sometimes it's been part from when they've been diagnosed with an illness and it's been straight away for the tracheostomy from that treatment onwards and if they're coming to the end of it um they're, you know having to be able to reverse the tracheostomy it's you know that next step great stuff um oh sorry go because it must be cultural because um in in melbourne as well our the families here do get carers at home if they have a child with tracheostomy and they do actually get benefits so those are the same as what you experience but our parents are 100 percent mm -hmm. of the time desperate to get the tracheostomy out maybe it's the swimming you know swimming's a big thing in australia um, <laughs> it's a lot warmer here perhaps swimming's less of a thing in scotland so i'm not, not being able to swim Perhaps that's more of a... Yeah, <laughs> just coming back to the financial issues, there may be differences in terms of out-of-pocket expenses in the Australian healthcare system not being balanced by the benefits. So maybe it's not so financially lucrative for you uh, as it is for our patients here. So it, there may well be differences that way. Anyway, it's interesting, interesting that, it's, that it's not something you see. Can I move on to a question that we've had from Desiree Bradley about... Um, she wants to know what type of patient parents education tools materials and strategies do we use do we engage any patient advisory councils or patient advocates when we write our protocols so two related questions so do you want to take the first one uh, over in melbourne about parent education tools materials and strategies uh yes we do but i must say it does it can be a little bit ad hoc um we certainly have the hospital has a um, plain speaking um, team and any of your any of your educational uh, products or pamphlets can go through them and they can get lay people to read them and make sure that it's something that that people you know who are not medical don't have a medical background would be able to understand um, we don't we do have a parent advisory committee but we don't um, you don't have to use them for every, you know for everything that you you produce so it really just depends I guess on I mean we we personally get a lot of feedback from families and with any of the material that we write and on the on the intranet the hospital guidelines uh, for parents so the parent fact sheets they go through all of those relevant, relevant um, areas for plain speaking, content, those sort of things, so yeah. And we, like, we recently did a, uh, it's still in draft form, a, a doctor's ABC one page document with instructions and pictures for parents to um, take home and as a reminder, reinforcer for how to manage uh, an emergency and with um, a tracheostomy emergency and with um, literally at the moment just handed half a dozen out to different parents with tracheostomy, uh, kids with trachies and just 
getting their feedback on what they think of it. Great. Joyce? Um, we, in the last year or so, have started up a kind of parent focus group. We've tried to do that. It is quite difficult with families from all over Scotland trying to um, you know, find a suitable place or a suitable time to do it. Um, so we've started that to try and review our current Track Us Parent booklet that we give out, which has got all information about from routine tube change to you know, emergency situations um, and everything in that. Um, we also managed this year to um, record a family. Um, it's a child aged nine years old. He's a tracheostomy since he was a baby. And it was all about their experience of living with a tracheostomy. It was really interesting. And we've started to um, sort of show the staff like that to, to really understand more of it, how it is personally for the, the family. And also our new tracheostomies that we've been um, but in recently, we have you know offered the family that can can watch this and just to, sometimes it's the challenges for these parents. Yeah. And around decannulation, do you have any specific material? Um, we do. We have a um, information leaflet that we give out again in relation to decannulation. Our well. most, I think, in both hospitals, the most important material is actually you guys. This yeah, is the yeah. personal relationship that our nurse specialists and Sue Allen and John over in Melbourne have with the parents and families and that's that's where all the information uh, comes from. So actually that's much better than anything written down. But we... We, we do it as a backup, yeah. yeah, we have, yeah, yeah. Backup. Actually we have, um, in the last two years, we have run um, our tracheostomy fun day, if you like. So it, it's a, 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 a Saturday um, where there's an opportunity for you know medical staff, nursing staff and our tracheostomy uh, patients and families to kind of get together um, in a slightly more informal setting, um, and we've incorporated um, some question and answer time within that. But it's a it's a great opportunity for the families to meet up, and actually they come up with so many tips and um, bits of advice that we're not aware of, or you know certainly I wouldn't be aware of. You know, but Joyce and Sylvia might be more aware of. Um, so it's important. And obviously, there's social media going on all the time, so you'll find that there are parents who've grouped together and they've got a, a Facebook group or something. So they're very good at um, giving that information as well. Yeah, yeah, we find the same. So, and and we one of our um, families is very involved and organise an annual Christmas uh, get together for families and the children and siblings who have a tracheostomy. And John and I go to that. That's this weekend. Yes, it's this weekend, um, and it's usually a great event. And and as you say, for families, they have, you know, they're living this experience, so they have lots of tips for each other. And I think they're a really good resource for each other. So where possible, we try and. Um, you know, if people are willing, introduce them to other families as well so that they can network a little. And one good thing about the ward is that um, the ward where the children go, because they're generally in the hospital or end up in that ward, they, the families do get to know each other anyway and, uh, and watch how, you know, how they deal with their individual problems. So it's great. Great. We've got loads of questions coming in, so we're going to have to get on a little bit more quickly. I've got one here from um, Kelly Weir asking, is there a difference in decannulation procedures depending on whether the child is managed by ENT versus respiratory versus PICU? <laughs> Shall I take that one quickly and just say, in both places, both in Melbourne and in Glasgow, and I've worked in both very recently, um, the care is done jointly. And it's a joint thing between ENT and respiratory, so it's not an either or. And protocols are agreed between both, and it's all delivered, in fact, by the nurse specialists, nurse consultants, who are kind of neutral. Um, but the, in, in Melbourne, it's, it's predominantly led by respiratory medicine, and in, the, uh, in Glasgow, it's predominantly led by, it's entirely led by ENT. But uh, it is very much a joint process in both places, so, uh, so there isn't really a difference. Um, and I hope that answers your question, Kelly. But what I am, but she asked another question, and also Olivia Moore asked this question, and that's about use of passing your speaking valves as a way of assessing readiness for decannulation. So, Joyce. So we we generally try a passing your valve assessment with most our trichosis patients, um, but it's not always an indication that they're going to be able to cope with the trial of decannulation. Um, I think sometimes it can be an indication that they are coping with managing secretions. Um, so they'll maybe cope with the capping, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that they will, to be honest. Um, we've had cases where they've not liked to pass me a valve, but they managed 
to fully decannulate. So it's a bit of a hit or a miss, really, to be honest. Mm -hmm. What about yourselves in um, Melbourne? Oh, I think very similar. Um, we'll often initially use um, passive mu valves early on in the piece, like long before we're even thinking about um, decannulation. Um, but closer to the time, we might be thinking about um, its effect on upper airway tone, um, managing secretions, um, and and as you've said too, Joyce, it's um, you can tolerate a speaking valve and not tolerate decannulation. Um, it's all about that uh, expiratory phase of the respiratory cycle. Um, but yeah, they're, they're useful, but not um, an indicator that uh, decannulation can be successful just because you tolerate the PMV. Um, the, the few, a couple of quick technical questions which we'll get to, and then there's some really interesting uh, family ones. So I'll just deal with this one. I have a question from uh, Marilena Trotzi at Rome Bambino Jesu Children's Hospital asking about the persistent tracheocutaneous fistula rates. You got an idea in Melbourne for us? I think it's about 50%. I think we close maybe slightly more, 50 to 60% of them need surgical closure, and we do it around six months. Melbourne? I think it's about the same. We are going to be looking at those numbers a little more closely, um, but but it is around 50%, I think half and half, and we do try after, if it's persistent after three months, if there are no other clinical indications, they'll be plan to have a closure but that could still be a you know a month away so somewhere between three and four months I guess for stoma closure. And we have a question from Cynthia Griffith asking about whether we ever perform capped sleep studies prior to decannulation. Um, what do you do in Melbourne? We've had some it's not routine so the ones we've had are for children who um, who we don't who we think will need nocturnal yeah. CPAP, yeah. and well. sorry, yeah. and so they would uh, we would do yeah. capped a capped yeah. sleep study yeah. to see whether they yeah. those children might need a um, uh, need CPAP nocturnally. But you wouldn't have it as a routine part of your decannulation protocol as such. No, no. correct. No, but and that's a, is that an abbreviated respiratory polysomnogram that you do, CAPS? Yeah, yeah. Full, full polysomnography. Full polysomnography, yeah. So there's only really, I think probably in the last year, there would only be one or two patients who have done that. And really as a, you know, will would they be able to manage decannulation with CPAP? So that's why. Um, do we ever do any CAPS polysomnograms as part of our assessment for readiness for decan? I don't think we do. No. We do a CAPT overnight downloadable scored pulse oximetry and transcutaneous uh, cap non capnometry uh, study, which we do as part of our protocol for every child. So they have a demonstrably normal kind of gas exchange study as part of the protocol and have done that for a few years. But we don't do any proper sleep studies. Um, I want to move on to a couple of questions which are really interesting. Um, Rachel Kerr, hello Rachel, speaks uh, <laughs> from Melbourne, in fact. Um, Tell Rachel to come up to the office and ask. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, she, she wants to know about a child who mourned her decannulation for some years because her tracky made her different. So she obviously mourned the loss of the thing that made her different and talks about access to psychology. Do you have access to psychology for these children in Melbourne? Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, we've got a fairly extensive um, psych, social and psych service at the hospital. So if we had, I mean, if we ident identified any child or family that we thought had um, uh, psychological issues, would they get referred? And I think too, Joyce, you sort of mentioned it, or maybe it was Tash before. I mean, we do have some families who, you know, we spend. You're right. You spend months or years you know, keeping the trackie in, keeping it patent, reinforcing that, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's out, see you later, you know. And I think that for some of those families, they do need a bit of the support about where to next and what it means for them and just their safe, the feeling of their child's safety. Because even though the trackie comes with a lot of risk, it can also um, 
it can also make people feel a lot safer because they know how to manage it and they're so used to that. So, yeah, I think for some families it's a big thing and their children. Absolutely. We counsel them almost, you know, so well into sort of receiving that um, tracheostomy, getting them used to it, and it's a complete shift to um, just say this is the time to, to, to get it out. So um, it's, it's the children and the parents. And, you know, you do see some very different responses, but... Um, you know, it's having the opportunity to speak to different uh, clinicians uh, and the psychology is important in that, especially with pediatric um, decannulations. Uh, we have access to child and adolescent mental health services and clinical psychology and uh, play specialists and all of those things. We don't have a psychologist sitting in as part of our tracheostomy team on a routine basis. I know some clinical services do, but our, we don't. I, I don't think you do in Melbourne either. Um, mm. I, don't think, I think most of the psychological support, again, comes down to our, our, our maids of all work. Um, <laughs> it comes down to Joyce and Sylvia, who do everything, including psychology. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a parent, Amy Woolgar, who sent us in a thing which I will read. So she says, my son was trached age two, had a laryngotracheal reconstruction, and decannulated age five. He was retraked age seven due to grade three subglottic stenosis again, and is due decannulation again next year. He's nearly 11 and he's struggling with the removal of his tube. How do you guys help children accept they can breathe without it? So Amy, I think the first thing is to make sure that you can in fact breathe without it and that his airway is adequate. So, you know, as you saw from our decannulation protocol, it starts with airway endoscopy under anaesthetic for that exact reason and a quarter of the children we thought were ready for decannulation it turns out were not because we we've, we've judged their airway is not adequate when we do our airway assessment under anesthesia so from our protocol if you, if you remember the the flow chart 25 percent of our kids um didn't get past that endoscopy stage and, and the majority of them would go on to further surgery to improve their airway and that's the decision that we made under the anaesthetic. So the first thing is to make sure the airway is actually, you know, as good as we can physically get it. Once we've got there though, and we think it is good, and we have a psychological issue, then, uh, Joyce. I think it's just talking the child round to the, you know, how good it would be without having a tube, and, you know, even if it's not successful, well, it's worth maybe having having a try at, at having it out. Um, but that is difficult. Eleven is quite a difficult age, isn't it? Um, For some of the younger children, maybe play specialist might be yes, helpful. Yes, I know, but eleven, 11 is not really play specialist territory, is it? So you're getting into more clinical psychology territory, yes, aren't you? Um, and it, it is. It's, it's that additional difficulty because you've already had one attempt. You know, you've done the persuasion of this is going to work. Uh, and then, you know, you found yourself, you know, not quite back to square one necessarily, but, you know, the tracheostomy is back in. Um, it's certainly one reason where, you know, we're very keen on that sort of prolonged period. Uh, and if it's not right at any stage, we, we try and stop it because you know, once you do have the tube out, you know, the, the hope would be that you would never have to have it back in, um, you know, because that's such an a, a emotional upheaval to just go, go all the way back. So it, it is difficult. So it's a difficult age. Um, and, you know, it might just it'd be a more lengthy process for, for that persuasion to, uh, to feel comfortable um uh, giving it a go again and, and you know definitely this is where you do want to take it a little bit slowly um, um uh, it, conversely when you get to maybe a bit older um then the psychology again can can change but um 11 is a, a little tricky but so um, yeah you may want to make it more of a prolonged like you know downsizing for a few days and then capping for a few a days time, yeah. and then and then removing you know kind of more over a, couple of weeks rather yeah. than um, that can be awesome. Partly for the psychological reason yeah. of yes. demonstrating beyond all doubt that you can breathe okay and manage. Mm -hmm. And also partly because you kind of have been through this before. Yes. And you really don't want to go through it a second time and not succeed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's um, it's quite a it's quite an ask. I, I would agree with Hayden that, you know, absolutely the first thing is making sure that it is ready, at least from every perceivable clinical point of view, um, to, to come out. We've just had a teenager in the last couple of weeks that was kind of similar, although his fail um, trial was, um, 
just you know in the last kind of month or so um and um he did take quite a bit of persuading um that it was worth another try to get out and has been successful and is so happy that we did persuade him but um, he was very anxious and we did do a kind of prolonged um over weekend kind of capping to get him used to that. So we have we have more questions coming in. I'm not sure how much time we have, but um, any special dressings to reduce the risk of persistent tracheocutaneous fistula? Another question. From, I'm not sure that dressings make any difference. To be honest, yeah. any view on that from Melbourne? We um, do an occlusive dressing while we're assessing their airway, um, but if the stoma is persistent, often an occlusive dressing isn't a long-term option anyway because the children get a can get a reaction on their skin from that. So sometimes, you know, it's sometimes we just leave it open if it's persistent and, and not too large and the family don't mind that. Sometimes I'll just put a Band-Aid. I don't personally think the dressing makes any difference as well. I think it's really patient comfort and um, what's suiting them the best. Yeah, John. yeah. It's just the that that initial period of the decannulation where you want an inclusive dress, dressing because you want them using their upper airway, <clears throat> and then after that, um, it's band aid type material and mostly anything that'll stay on. <laughs> That's yeah. usually the difficulty. And stay on for like a longer period of time. That has change dressing every day. Like that's kind of usually the goal yeah. is to get something to last. So. Fair enough. Um, another question in: Are there many occasions? And we are one minute over time. You know what, though? There's two more questions. I'm going to very quickly go through. Are there many occasions where capping is not successfully tolerated, but decannulation is still trialled and successful? Yes. Yes. I would, I would say there are. Uh, we, we have a major issue with very young children. So anyone we're trying to decannulate under 18 months, they may not tolerate breathing past a cap tube, uh, even a very small tube. So sometimes we will try that, cap them, and then remove the tube and sit with them for a few hours and, and monitor them one-to-one -one very closely. Uh, any issues in Melbourne? That's just what I was going to say. It's really that, that infant group yeah. where even this, a 3.5 takes up a significant proportion of their airway and they might just not have enough space to breathe around their tracky tube. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think probably we're going to have to call it a day. So I'm going to... Uh, put up my thank you slide. Hope you can see that. Okay, so I want to. I want these are the contact details for everyone that participated today, and I want to just thank everyone for taking part. Uh, and these are the contact details in case you want to um, get in touch with anyone. And I just wanted to also let you know the webinar has been recorded and will be available in the webinar archive on the GTC website. And don't forget the next webinar, which is going to be. Monday the 4th of February, um, or 5th of February if, if you're in Australian time, but it's Monday the 4th of February at those times, and it's talking tracheostomy tubes, so it's all about facilitating phonation in ventilated patients. So once again, thank you to everyone for taking part, including all the participants who've been watching at home and for sending in your questions, and thank you so much. And if I didn't get a chance to answer your questions, I'm sorry. Um, so thanks very much, everybody. And I think we'll draw this on. Thanks, bye everyone. Bye. bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. How do we exit?